and welcome to the AA Podcast, brought to you by the Rondo Media Group. So we're signing off to the end of a great Barclays Premier League season, saying farewell to the likes of Luton, Burnley and Sheffield United, good riddance to be honest, and hello to the likes of Ipswich and Leicester City, playoffs yet to be played. So, AA, City have just been crowned champions of the Premier League for the fourth season in a row best in the league but what I really want to talk about is the runners up Arsenal 20 years no Premier League title what does this mean for them hey man what's the message for Arsenal today I think look firstly well done to the players you know you fought well you pushed City hard well done to the manager a great up-and-coming manager who is, you know, making a real competition out of the league. But the fans, <laughs> rest in piss. You had this coming. I'm sorry. The arrogance that we've seen from Arsenal fans across this season, across all time, to be honest, but especially across this season, coming from my manager, Klopp, talking about the fact that Tet is going to equal his legacy in half the time. Talking like they've, always talking like they've won something. Talking with arrogance. Talking about how they're going to do this and that. And how they're back at the top of the world. Now you will learn humility. It has been so enjoyable to see Arsenal end up with nothing. Zilch. Zilch. Listen, listen. I think for Arsenal though, in all seriousness though. Um, even though it has been, you know, 20 years with no Premier League, no Champions League, you know, which is crazy for a club of their magnitude. I still think they've got a lot of good things going. They've got a young squad. They've got a young manager. And to be honest, it just means go again. Go again for another season. And I do think they've got a good chance to get in this league. Listen, City will have an off year. It doesn't seem like they ever will, but they will eventually have an off year. You saw it happen with Liverpool, you know. We did get 99 points, but, you know, Laporte was injured. They just didn't really quite see the same. I think City got something like 81 points that season. So, there will be an off year and Arsenal can keep on pushing. And who knows, Pep might leave. We hope so. So, for Arsenal, I think, you know, the general message is, is keep on pushing and for their fans to learn a little bit of humility, which I'm sure they've had a do- they've had a dose of right now, so that's good to see. Over to you. Chelsea's worst season, Arsenal's best season, same amount of trophies. Anyway, moving on, let's get on to Manchester City. The four Pete, four in a row. They've won it again. Is this the best team to ever grace the Premier League? Is it the best team to grace the Premier League? So I think that's an interesting question because when you look at it, it's um, it's sort of it's a couple of different teams across the four P, um, and uh, across kind of a lot of their recent success. So I don't know if they're the best team ever because this treble winning team and this team that's won the fourth title is very different to the Aguero, Sterling and Mares team that kind of, you know, got Centurions, etc., and all of this. So um, I wouldn't say it's maybe the best team ever. I think that's still up for debate, but this is the most dominant club. A cl- this is the most dominant a club has been over a period of time. Over Chelsea, over the great Man United, like six PLs in seven years. Four Pete now off the back of a treble. There's been no club that has been this dominant. And I think when we talk about the best ever, we still have to start talking about Pep. And I know you have a couple of questions about him, but I think the discourse should be more focused on him because he's the real constant in this city absolute dominance which is starting to get a little bit depressing funny that you brought up Pep um, you said he's probably the greatest the Premier League has seen um, many a fan especially those who were around back in the day will tell you that it's without a doubt Ferguson who won that's Alex Ferguson who won 13 Premier League titles in 27 years he has the most Premier League titles out of any manager does Pep really live up to the great of Sir Alex? 
Okay, so let's go bar for bar. So you said Ferguson has got 13 Premier League titles in 27 years. And I think he's got one Champions League and I'm sure he's got many, um, got two Champions League in that time and he's got um, quite a few FA Cups and League Cups. Pep Guardiola pff, certainly has many FA Cups and League Cups. I can't imagine that. I feel like in your, if you're looking at rate of time will be more. He's got six leagues in eight years and he's got a Champions League. On top of that, he's got the most points ever in the Centurions. He's got the four Pete now. He's got multiple 90 plus point seasons in terms of, and when you look at the way that they've played and the way that they won their Champions League that they did as well, I feel like it has to go to Pep. I feel like the only thing now is longevity. Yes, longevity. Yes, doing it over three decades. But when you look at Pep's effect with, with football, you really think if he stayed here longer that it would change? You really think Pep can't ad adapt to different, um, you know, different eras of football? Football kind of moves with Pep. It kind of moves with Pep's, with Pep's tactics. When we see the way the rest of football copies the things that he's done with the inverted fullbacks, with the F9s, with the inside forwards. So... I honestly feel like Pep is, is the best PR manager ever. Um, is, could you, I feel like the only argument for Fergie is that maybe he's the greatest because he has the longevity. But if you're talking about the best, the quality, if you're looking at the time ratio of the trophies won, it's Pep without a shadow of a doubt. You look at the records, you look at the amount of titles that he's getting in a shorter span of time than Ferguson. Pep is the best ever, most certainly. And now moving forward with that, I give him that. He's the best ever manager that we've had in the PL. All the records you've had, the Centurions, the Trebles, the 4P. Now get the heck out of my league. Pep, it's enough. You've done enough, my bro. You've done everything. I just reeled off all of those accolades. It's okay. Please give me my, pre my Premier League back. We're sorry. I'm saying the media are sorry for ever doubting you, for saying that you won't be able to do it here, for saying that this is the most competitive league. We get it. It's okay. It is okay. Please, just leave so I can actually know who's gonna like, not know who's gonna win the league before the beginning of the season, so I can get my Premier League back. I'm almost, you know, like I so didn't want Arsenal to win this league, but I'm also, I'm almost missing someone I know winning the league because every year it feels like every t every year City win. It's almost like. Yeah, we can like, you know, we can bypass the year. But how many, how many years are we going to bypass? Bro, he's taken my whole 20s away. Six out of seven leagues. My whole 20s just, he's just been, everything's just been pep, 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 pep. When did we, you know, like, please, bro, just give me my league back, man. Please, please. So Pep's contract's due to expire next year. He said some funny words. We, we don't know if he's going, if he's not going. But I also want to reiterate, Pep, you need to leave the league. Let someone else win it, man. You've done enough. Go manage Spain. Start a Catalonia um, national team. Do something, man. Okay, can I just say quickly, sorry, just, just on that. Pep was at Barcelona for four years. Why is it Man City? <laughs> you I think he, he hit Man City in 2016. It's been eight years. Why are you here for twice the time of your boyhood club? He was in Bayern for three years. He was in, in the Bundesliga for three years. But it's the Premier League that he wants to terrorise for eight years. Bro, go away. You're not even English. You know what I mean? You're Spanish, bro. You're speaking your second language. Go back, man. Go back. Go see your, your extended family. Miss you. Go back. Go see them. Like, bro, what, what is it that... I, I really feel like he's, he's got... I think it's something... Because I think Pep's a villain. All this nice guy act, I don't believe it. I think it's all that doubt that the British media give him at the start that he wants he wants to squeeze all oh, this Ferguson's better than you, all this you won't be able to do it, you won't be able to play tiki taka. He wants to squeeze the life out of us and really show us, don't you ever doubt me. I could make a mockery of this league and we get it. It's enough now. Okay, let's move on to some of the other results from today's VIP fixtures. As you know, every single team played. One I would like to highlight is the great Crystal Palace. Palace 5, Aston Villa 0. Hey, talk to me. What's going on in Selhurst? Listen, Palace right now, they're playing football out of their mind. We've spoken so much about their front three. But to be honest, their whole team playing direct, vibrant football, beautiful play in between the lines. They are electric right now. And to think, Villa are a good side. And I know Villa are probably half drunk after making the Champions League, but to smash them 5-0, they, 
they are a team that I can't wait to watch next season because I think they've gone under the radar because they're a mid-table club and it's not like they were chasing anything, right? The form that they've been in, when you look at their past their past few games, they have been on fire. Hats off to them. I won't do more on them since we've spoken to them about in the in the last couple of weeks quite a lot. So let's move on to other clubs. But Palace, can't wait to watch you next season. Honestly, honestly. Um, on to the victims of that result, Villa. So Villa ended the season in fourth place, Champions League spot, but they lost 5-0. It was their final game of the season. Should they be worried? And also, also, do you feel like under Emery, they can go into Europe next season and do anything? Or are they just going to bow out in the group stages? I don't think it's too damaging of a result for Villa, right? Like I said, I feel like, you know, they probably were drunk, had celebrations. I feel like Palace were probably really fired up to it. They've still got this new manager who probably still wants to make a message for them. But looking at Villa wider than that and coming away from that and them in the Champions League next season, I do feel like that it probably won't go for them the way that they want to in the Champions League next season. I think the Champions League is always tough to adapt to. The games are very tactical. If you don't have players who are used to it, they struggle a lot because it's so different to the Premier League. You can play opposition, which maybe on paper you have better players, than, but they, they're very smart. They know how to... They really understand game states. Opposition managers are a lot more... Like managers in foreign leagues, they're a lot more tactical than the English media and the general feeling here often gives them credit for. So I do feel like Villa really may struggle to, to you know, to kind of match up despite the fact that they do have a fair bit of quality. So I think it would do them well to invest in some proven European talent and I think try and qualify again next year. I think that's where Newcastle shot themselves in the foot a bit because I feel like it's always the second, third year in the Champions League where you start to gradually do a bit better. We saw that journey with Manchester City who had a lot more quality than Aston Villa did. So I think... Just try and give it your best shot. If you go out in group stages, if you go out in the last 16, no problem with it. But invest in that European talent to kind of give yourself a little bit more of a chance and try and qualify again. It will be tough, but try and qualify again because the Champions League, it takes time. But they do have a manager in Emery who is, you know, a top tier European tactician. So we'll have to see. I agree with what you said somewhat, but I want to talk about precedent here. Um, I don't know if you recall, you actually, Liverpool actually played this team, Villarreal in the Champions League semi-final. Mm. I wouldn't call Villarreal a European giant. Yeah. They weren't very frequent in that competition, but under Unai Emery, they were able to, for two seasons in a row, sort of challenge in the Champions League. Why can't Villa do the same with the same manager? Arguably better players as well. Yeah, so like like I said, I did caveat caveat my response to the fact that they have got Emery. You know, he is uh, you know a veteran in in the in European football, so he could be a difference for them. So you never know. Like he could take them further than 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 um uh than than I thought. And I do think, to be fair, when you make the point of Villarreal, it's it's, it's a fair point. But I think Villarreal are still more used to European football. Um, despite the fact before they went to the Champions League, they'd played and been successful in the Europa League. So they're still used to those games and the level of tactical um, you know, quality that you get within them. I know that Villa have been in the conference, but just one season. So again, I still do have my doubts, but I think it is a fair point. I do think there's some contingency there. Just for me, I think they will end up struggling in their first season. And I think they should try go again. You know, champ hopefully Champions League, but even if it's maybe Europa, then they can, you know, push on and try and do something. So going back to the actual result, um, the five nil defeat to Crystal Palace meant that Aston Villa finished on sixty eight points. And in fifth place we had Spurs, who won three nil today, with sixty six points, two points behind Aston Villa. And that would suggest to me that Man City game was a lot bigger than people gave it credit for. If they had won that game, they would be finishing in the Champions League spot. So do you feel like Ange Postacoglu was right to come out against the Spurs fans and the club as a whole based on what has turned out? Listen, I think the fans will always have their own view because I feel like with the fans, 
as long as it's not in their hands, and to be honest, actually, with Spurs fans, I feel like even if it was in their hands, with fans, like, for Spurs, getting top four, right, is something that they've done before. Arsenal winning the Premier League for the first time in 20 years is a much bigger deal. And that rivalry is always so toxic. And listen, Arsenal, Spurs had the chance. Remember, Ange had the chance to get a result against Arsenal, and he didn't. He lost however many games, you know, on the back. Like, I think he's lost five of the last six before this last game against Sheffield. So, do you know what I mean? So, I think with Spurs fans, I do get it. Like, you know, in the end, they could have done something with what Palace have done to Villa. But, come on, man, Spurs fans are always going to be, you know, they're always not going to want Arsenal to do something, you know, historic for them in comparison to them doing something which is, yeah, which is good for their progression. But is it really something? If it was, say, okay, Spurs are going for the title and Arsenal are going for the title and maybe Spurs are a couple of points off and if they lose against City, they're out of the title race, then that would be crazy. But just for top four, if I'm a Spurs fan, I'm probably still swayed to to hating on Arsenal. I feel like most fans would be in that boat. You know, Arsenal fans suddenly are trying to act like, you know, they're the, you know, the centre of morality when it comes to trying to be ambitious for your club. But a lot of people have mentioned it. And I remember like a few years ago when the Spurs were going to play uh, Liverpool in the Champions League. And you know, Spurs winning the Champions League, that's something that Arsenal haven't done. Would have been huge for Spurs. All of them were, were uh, again, like a little scenario was going around that. Would you lose the Europa League against Chelsea if it meant that Spurs lose the Champions League? And the amount of Arsenal fans that were saying yes. Bro, it's the same thing, man. Like sometimes the hate overrides support for your club if the support if it's if the achievement is not making sense. And that's that's the beauty of the game. That is the beauty of the game. And I wouldn't change it. Good old fashioned rivalries, huh? <laughs> um, but moving on, I know this topic's gonna be dear, dear to your heart. Klopp had his final farewell. Victory against Wolves. The German has left the Premier League. How did you feel about the whole farewell and more than that? What legacy do you feel like Klopp has left on the Premier League, if at all any? So the farewell, man, the farewell, it was heartwarming. Um, it was, yeah, it was, it was a lot. It was emotional. I watched it today on the sofa and it really... Like a little girl. <laughs> uh, internally, man, there were no tears. I'm a real G to the, to the end of time. But um, no, but honestly, uh, no, I, I, I'm not going to say it. I was a little bit emotional watching it. You know, I mean, for me, um, seeing Klopp say his, you know, his last few words and, you know, just seeing what he meant to the players, to the fans. It was beautiful to see because he meant a lot to all of us because I feel like you look at Klopp, for many of us, right, you know, supporting Liverpool, yes, it was a club that we were proud of, but, you know, we were not succeeding on the pitch to the level of club that we are. Do you know what I mean? 30 years, no Premier League not really consistently challenging. And the way Klopp transformed that, you know, he came in with that famous line about turning doubters into believers. And boy, did we not just believe, but we became a real force within Europe. People can question, you know, the fact that maybe we didn't build a dynasty, but you cannot say for many of the years that Klopp were here, we were a serious outfit and we were serious challengers. And yeah, man, that was just beautiful to have. And even more than that, I just feel like he's a... He's such a more than football type of character, man. He's a character that you really buy into, man. He's a, he felt like, obviously I don't know Klopp personally, but you feel like he's a good person, man. Like he's one like celebrity, if you will. Like, you know, often with celebrities, I don't get too connected to them because I'm always like, I don't know you outside of what you're doing, but he's a person that I feel like I know a bit. And he's one person that I feel like many Liverpool fans are, I can't imagine it, but if you ever heard him doing something crazy, you'd feel betrayed. And for me, I know a lot of people get into celebrities. Like I don't personally. I that's quite that speaks a lot on somebody because I actually almost trust their character because of what I've seen from them. What a guy he is, and what a legacy he's left. Like when people talk about, I mean, I'm just gonna kind of touch on it again. People talk about the fact that only one PL, one CL. You know, only one every trophy once. I feel like it's such limited analysis. Carabao twice, yeah. I feel like it's such limited analysis. You really have to look at, it was in the Pep era. You have to look at, you know, 90 plus points twice, three Champions League in five years. We were a force. 
Champions League, yeah, three Champions League finals in five years. We were a force and you can't deny the way that he transformed us as well. So, you know, people can say whatever they want, but I know what Klopp was to us and I know what he did. Um, I know you touched on it a bit, but um, given that he only won each trophy once, um, apart from the Carabao Cup, which he won, won twice, and given the fact that Pep was so dominant, and a lot of Liverpool fans have called this the golden era for Liverpool Football Club. Would you say Jurgen Klopp underachieved in his time there? Um, I feel like underachieved is a harsh phrase. I get it, you know, but I feel like it's more Pep was just so good. And, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes you are the second best of your time. But let's not let's not act like Pep isn't the best ever. And listen, you can maybe argue about Fergie. Okay, that's the second best ever. If we're really looking at it, he's probably the best ever, isn't he? Because it's like I said, it's just a it's just a time thing when you compare to Fergie. So I feel like when you're when you kind of take that into consideration and you actually analyze things properly, you have to look at Klopp and say, he's done really well. You know, you know, Teta, who I think is a fantastic manager, and people are talking about how he's been the next Messiah, he's now failed in two title races on the spin to to Pep Guardiola, you know what I'm saying? And he's kind of committed everything to those races as well and not being able to win anything. And I think he's a very good manager, by the way. I'm analysing seriously. So I do think we have to give Klopp still a lot of credit. I don't think he's underachieved. I feel like, yes, he could have done more, but I still think he's done fantastic. And I think um, when we talk about it, as it, is it a golden era? I think maybe, we, I don't know if we can call it a golden era. That's the only thing. It's maybe golden in the PL era for Liverpool because this is the most that we've achieved during this time. But if you're talking wider speaker, speaking, it's probably not a golden era because I think with a golden era, you got to win doubles, you got to win trebles, you got to, you know, do something historic. Unfortunately, there's nothing crazy historic about this Liverpool team, you know, um, in terms of over the course of a season. Did we break a points record? Did we go undefeated? Okay, there's that. There's that. That's that's that is actually a you know a, a pretty good feat to be fair. But I will be honest and say I'm not sure it's a golden era. I'm not sure, but I wouldn't. But I can't say underachieved. I can't say underachieved. And now that Klopp has left, he is being replaced by Arn Slot from Feyenoord. Um, we've had. I've asked your opinions of him in the past. Um, but do you feel like the foundations are there for him to kick on for next season and? What is the goal moving forward for Liverpool Football Club? Yeah, I would say there's good foundations for him to move forward. I would say that he has to have time. You can't come after Klopp and think that he's going to be the same. You can't come after everything that Klopp was and think that we're just going to be challenging because it's such a whole cultural reset for the club, for the players. The players have to get used to him. They have to get used to his idea. We've seen what's happened after the likes of Ferguson have left after the likes of Wenger has left. It takes time. If Ancelot is even the manager that gets us challenging again, that's a huge achievement when you've had a manager who's had such an effect over a long period. It's normally like a couple managers in and then things start going. In the case of United, 10 years on, still hasn't got right for them. In the case of Arsenal, it's been about five years now, five, six, no, about six years since they, uh, since Ferguson, no, since Wenger left, sorry. And they're now finally getting it right in Arteta. So I think just put um, taking us forward is the best thing that Arnslot can do. Well, kind of, we're going to go two steps back and then taking us forward from there. So can we get top four next year? Can he get a playing style in that we all buy into, that the players buy into, that then the fans buy into? Can we have that? And then I think, okay, now I'm on board. Now, okay, when you add a few players, can we start challenging? But that challenging, you know, if he's challenging in, you know, 26, 27, if I'm seeing a playing style, if I'm seeing us consistently get better, I'm not going to rush him out. So I feel like that analysis has to become much wider, you know, and you have to be, it has to be a lot more considered when you're looking at a manager coming after a manager like Klopp and anybody who's looking to rush into him saying, oh yeah, we need to challenge because you've got this player and that player. I think they need to be a little bit guided in the in terms of the circumstances that he's coming into. Okay, that's enough on Liverpool. Let's do a quick roundup of the other games and the other teams. So Chelsea finished sixth this season. Nobody would have thought this. Um, so what's your take on their season as a whole, where they finish, and what's the plan? What were their what should be their goal for next season? 
So I can't lie, Chelsea finishing sixth is surprising. Um, it, I mean, a lot of the PR that they got because of the, the money that they spent, and I think that a lot of that was caused by their owners being quite foolish and it was a shame for the players that they have, meant that, yeah, they were under heat. And it always felt, and like the media also showed, like it always felt like they were a million miles away from, you know, even a position like sixth, even, even from like the EOL spaces. So the fact that they've managed to, you know, you know, have some good form and finish sixth is is a credit to them, really. And a credit to some of those young players, particularly players like Cole Palmer, who I feel like have been amazing. I think for Chelsea now, I think it's kick on because you've got a very young squad, you know, that we know didn't have a lot of senior experience as well, which I think was a huge factor. So I think it's just a matter of um, really now starting to, to kick on, like the players will improve. The manager as well. It seemed like it took Poch a while to find his feet. So I think he needs to kick on as well. So I think it's just about consistently improving now. I know Chelsea have been a club where the fans have been very used to instant success. But I feel like there's a little bit to buy into now. I think Poch deserves a second season. A lot of these players deserve a second season. The Gustos, you know what I mean? The Madukes, even the Jacksons that people are less patient with. Give them a second season. You can see the improvements. You can see that they're starting to tick. They're starting to purr. And see, for Chelsea, I think they need to try and get top four next season. I think if they don't get top four, then sack Poch. Um, then maybe you start looking at, maybe the Jacksons aren't good enough. Maybe the Madukes aren't good enough. But there's enough now for me. Buy into these players. There's enough now. Buy into the manager. There's enough. Like, you also look at the way that they were able to go head-to-head -head against the top clubs in certain games. Yes, in other games, they... You know, they didn't do the best, but you can, I feel like you you don't know football if you didn't see glimpses of the fact that Chelsea can be a very good team. Because when they're on game, there's very good glimpses there. 100% agreement with that. Um, we've covered five of the top six, might as well cover the last one. United, finishing eighth this season. No European football. What's gone wrong? Well, with United, I feel like, about a quarter of the way through the season, I feel like everybody could see this. Um, now, maybe not them coming eighth, but I was, I, I saw seventh. Eighth is not a, a far away from, from seventh. I, I honestly said like, all the teams that finished ahead of them, Villa, Newcastle, Spurs, I said better teams. United, Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea, to be fair, I'm surprised. So that's why I'm surprised they've come eighth because I actually thought Chelsea were going to come like eighth. But, you know, even Chelsea managed to put it together. When you look at United, these things I spoke about when I said if Klopp leaves, I want Onslaught to come in and have a playing style, um, show improvements, have something that I can, that the players can buy into, that the fans can buy into. They have none of it. And I think that's the problem. The, the, the players look disjointed. They never really look like they have a good idea of what they're trying to do. The fans don't know what they're seeing on the pitch. Everything around United right now is toxic. And I, I just saw it coming. Like they just they really rely on individual bits of quality to pull them through and key players like Rashford, you know, um, like Anthony, you, you, they just, well, I say Anthony's a key player, he's meant to be, but, you know, Sancho, they, they just weren't able to make it work, you know, over the course of, of, of this season. So with United, it's a huge going back to the drawing board for me. You sack Ten Hag. I think that is, I, I said it before, I think he needs to go. They've got the new structure in. Hopefully their recruitment will improve. I think they should get rid of 60% of their squad. I'm dead honest. I think they should get rid of They should start just churning them out in the same way that Arsenal did, um, in the same way that, what other clubs did, in the same way that Liverpool did. you got to just start getting out, you know, all the, 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 the dirty weeds that are within the club. I think Rooney did an interview <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Rooney did an interview and he said like, Bruno, the young players, Rashford needs to make a decision on whether he wants it or not. And he said, the rest of them, I'll get rid of them. And the Sky Sports presenter was flabbergasted. He couldn't believe it. Like he looked at literally about 70% of the squad. He said to get rid of them. Rooney was being dead honest. They need to get rid of a lot of players. And it's not going to happen over one season. But they need to start just doing it, doing whatever they can, paying guys off, ripping up contracts, just doing what they can to just get them out because the players as much as the manager's not good enough and he needs to go those players have been a horrible consistent or constant I should say across their lack of any sort of success to the magnitude of a club like Man United over these 
past few years. So they need to look at that as well. And that's the only way that they can look to improve and, and hopefully get better. Um, we're going to conclude soon, but I just want to give... Um, I want to hear your wrap up of the season. How did you find the season? Was it entertaining? How do you rate the season compared to other seasons as well? Yeah, I thought it was a good season. I think like the end of is I like towards the end it got a bit boring. Um, you know when I could see that. Listen, from the Villa game, as soon as Arsenal lost that Villa game, which was a few weeks ago to be fair, so this, it was still interesting throughout. I knew City would win the title. I, I knew some people said. Oh, before that, oh, City will win. But I thought they were just being a bit like, just because City are the best team. Just, like, I feel like the three-horse way, race at the at the top of the table, that was really interesting to see three clubs go for it for that long in the season. Liverpool, Arsenal and City. Some of the games that they had as well were really good watches um, in terms of the, well, the Arsenal-City games were never that good, very tactical. But I thought the City-Liverpool game at Anfield was a really good watch. I thought the one that the had was good as well. So I thought the tyre race was good towards the end, then City stretched away. Mid-table clubs doing what they do, still a lot of them, you know, kind of coming up to the plate. Palaces, you know, that that kind of change of form, that was mad. You know, Villa sort of, can I even call them mid-table, them coming into the top four, really good top four race as well. Um, you know, you had kind of Newcastle being up and down, but they're still a great watch at times. And I didn't, to be fair, I didn't really find the relegation battle that, that good though. I thought that was quite poor. I kind of expressed my opinion on that um, in a, co a couple of weeks before, well, kind of two weeks on the spin, I thought. Two months, I thought, I thought all of the relegation sides, Bar and you know, Burnley and Sheffield, I thought they were horrible additions to the league. I thought they were very poor. I thought they were just three points for so many teams. I just thought those clubs, when they're going away from home against top half teams, I was always so sure that they'd lose, which you never really want to see in the Prem. But a, a, a decent Premier League season, but I just feel like now that it's ended, I'm so tired of City winning. So I'm like, my big thing now is just get, get Pep out of the league because, you know, people can talk about all the money that City have. It's him. Trust me, it's him. Chelsea have spent loads. Arsenal have spent loads recently. He's still flipping winning um, because he is that good. So um, just get him out. And then I feel like we'll have such a great league on our hands. There's honestly so many teams that I could sit down and watch. Like I like watching Fulham from time to time. Like I remember Fulham back in the day to be fair, there was a time where they had a little team as well. But like the fact that Fulham are a good watch and they're like, what, 11th or something like that, 10th? Like there's so many good teams in the Prem, so many teams to watch. But it's just, it's just like, and people won't even believe how competitive the Prem is because City keep on winning it. Like, um, yeah, it's mad. But uh, yeah, like uh, it's still been a good Premier League season. But yeah, I think that's, that, that's kind of last words from me. I've been rambling on a bit. Well, that is all from us on the A podcast and Ronda Media of, for this season. We will be back with a short Champions League episode and after that, some Euro highlights. Euros, Euros. But thank you for listening. Like, comment and subscribe. Big up UAA. Come on, man. We love you all. Like, comment and subscribe. You heard the man. <laughs> <laughs>